In this video, we'll be talking a little bit about the evolution of humans. So the reason to think about this is that history matters, right? So for people, their personal history matters, right? These are the flags of the countries in which I have lived. When I saw this movie on a date, which I don't recommend doing, I was probably the only person in the audience who really kind of felt like they wanted to go there because of my childhood in Africa. I'm a British citizen, so this movie meant a lot to me, that was my king in this movie. And my hipster credibility comes from the fact that I've been watching this show since before uh, most of you were born. And then it also matters for group identities, right? So various groups have different emotional reactions to pictures of these people or the, this flag on a car. Uh, if you go to India, pictures from India, the swastika as depicted this way is all over the place. It's a good luck symbol of course co-opted by the Nazis in something like this. And then these are other symbols from World War II that mean a lot to certain groups. This is actually a modern political movement that has very right-wing ideas, and you can see a kind of connection there. These two symbols are very, very similar, right? One you're probably familiar with, the other one because of your group history, you're probably not familiar with. So just by looking at symbols, we can see that the history that we have individually and the history that we have as groups influence how we perceive many things. So the history of people and groups is important, and the history of humanity is important for the same sort of reasons. From earlier, if we think about what a phylogenetic tree represents, right, history is this change through time, we get to a state here, and understanding why groups are similar here, or relationships here, is best understood with this historical approach, right? We understand geography and context today by being aware of the history in the past. And, in fact, to return to one of the ideas from the philosophy of science early in the semester, the recognition of this power of context and history is actually what motivates professional creationists to write books like this, right? They have a concern that if we accept a history of animal behavior and history of animal evolution and an identity as an animal, that we'll begin to act that way, right? If we see that as our history, that will shape our current actions. So they actually like seek to prevent us from becoming bad people by denying that we've evolved from animals, right? The word will act like animals if we think we are animals. Of course, a response to something like this, a response to any sort of thought that we should not think about history is, well, should we deny bad history of things that have happened? Should we deny the fact that the Crusades happened? Should we kind of forget that the Holocaust happened. Well, no, it wasn't a very good thing to have happened, but it's important to be aware of it. And just because we have this in our history doesn't mean that we're going to do it again or that we should do it again, right? Or if we think about creationists, should we deny that humans are animals? Because if humans are not animals, drug testing on animals makes no sense at all. Studying how animals respond to diseases makes no sense at all if we're not historically connected to them. On the other hand, Context in history, of course, is not everything, right? With knowledge, we can learn and change, right? The knowledge of this allows us to try to make sure it doesn't happen again. If we didn't have this knowledge, we would repeat these errors, right? So to deny any kind of history causes us to make mistakes in the future. And our evolutionary history also matters. So as a fictionalized version of this, in the, the movie War of the World and the book, there's this quote at the end, by the toll of a billion deaths, man had earned his immunity, his right to survive among this planet's infinite organisms. And that right is ours against all challengers, for neither do men live nor die in vain. Um, the aliens are killed off uh, by the common cold virus, uh, which in this fictionalized story is something we've evolved uh, resistance to, but aliens did not. That's a fictionalized how history causes humans to be one way, but we have a number of genuine examples. So the history of cystic fibrosis arising within Europe has led to Caucasians having much higher rates of cystic fibrosis than other groups. Ashkenazi Jews have very high rates of Tay-Sachs because of their history. African and African-American individuals have high rates of sickle cell disease because of an evolutionary history involving a resistance to malaria. Um, this is the same reason why individuals in, from Mediterranean populations have beta thalassemia, a similar disease that leads to resistance from malaria that is now common in areas that are prone to malaria. Non-European populations are lactose intolerant, and that's best understood as a history where humans are ancestrally lactose intolerant 
It's only within Europe that lactose tolerance evolved so we can understand this difference between Europeans and non-Europeans by thinking about the evolution that Europeans underwent. So a number of different medical conditions are best understood by taking a historical approach to how humans have evolved. The evolutionary history of humans, or a history of humanity, or a connection with nature, is seen in a lot of different cultures. So for example, in Hinduism, there are ten incarnations of Vishnu, first as a fish, then as a turtle, then as a boar, then as a half-lion, then as a dwarf, and then finally as different types of humans. It's like a continuum being described here between animals and humans. And from China, there's a very famous story of a monkey who wears clothes and learns how to cast spells, wants to be like a person, denied getting into heaven because he's not human, and then has many of the human faults and raises an army and causes all sorts of problems. These kind of connections between animals and humans that we see may have arisen because exposure to primates in the East may have led those cultures to be more embracing of this continuum between mankind and animal kind. It's very difficult to deny our evolutionary connection to monkeys or apes when you see monkeys and apes doing very human things all the time. On the other hand, in Europe, there are actually very, very few primates. There's only one very small part of Europe that has native primates. Most Europeans would have never been exposed to them. So it's easy for Europe to have attitudes that humans are very different from all other animals when they don't encounter the other animals that are the most similar to humans. How history shapes what we think is or is not, you can actually see in an example of alcohol versus marijuana, right? So alcohol is totally accepted, everything's fine in culture, it's almost mandatory at some social events. Whereas marijuana, which has almost the exact same biological effects, is illegal and demonized. Well, historically, this was present in Europe for all of Europe's history. Historically, this was not present in Europe for Europe's history. And even though they're very similar in terms of their effects on people, we end up with one being accepted and one not being accepted. So history of humans and kind of where we've lived shapes our attitude about things. An interesting thing about this connection with primates is even when creationists, who typically arise from European cultures, even when creationists deny the evolution of humans, it's actually very easy for them to pick out the species that seem the closest and deny their relatedness, right? So, and that doesn't really make sense. Like, how is it that creationists can actually point to apes and monkeys and say, oh, look, those are not our relatives. We're totally not evolved from them. Well, they shouldn't even be able to point to a group that they're worried about us thinking we're evolved from if humans are totally separate. All right, so what are these species that um, we are most similar to? So within primates, there's a large number of species. The group that is most similar to us, or that includes us, is the great apes. There are four great apes. There's orangutans, two types of orangutans. There's chimpanzees, two types of chimpanzees. Gorillas, two types of gorillas. And then humans, or homo sapiens, we're widespread now. We're everywhere in the world. We are originally from Africa, which is where chimpanzees are, and gorillas. Orangutans actually live in Asia. And this is our kind of our family group, right? Our closest relatives are chimps, gorillas, and orangutans. Um, this is what orangutans look like. Uh, here's pictures from the San Diego Zoo. Orangutan, the word, actually comes from Malaysian, from the Malay language. Orang, meaning man, hutan, meaning forest. They actually named these things basically old men of the forest they did not see a big difference between those animals out in nature and themselves. This is what gorillas look like. So gorillas uh, you've seen in movies or you've seen at the zoo. They do many of the same behaviors that we do. Breastfeeding, for example, um, care for young. This is what humans look like, in case, in case you were wondering. It's actually interesting, though, how media really shapes what we think humans look like. So this is Faith Hill. This is Faith Hill on a magazine cover. So we can actually see, uh, let's do a side-by-side -side comparison. So this is her before Photoshop, right? So she's got this gigantic bulge of fat right there that's been shaved off. She's got this tree trunk-like arm there that's been skinnied down, in fact, so much that they had to add in an extra arm at the back. She's got these like deep divots in her face that they've smoothed out. 
This is what we see on the magazine though, right? But this is reality. And it's really interesting that so much of our belief in the way humans are is shaped by media that we get to the point where we think this is the reality, but this is the reality. Unless you think this is only females that do this, here's a recent photo shoot. This is the original. This is the after for um, Justin Bieber. So they've taken and like defined up his chest there and they've added a little bit more down there because that's also good for advertising. So we have inaccurate views of humans also presented to us. So when you, when you think about what you look like, it may be on a continuum from there to there, but we always um, want to take it into account there's lots of variation within humans. All right, and then the other type of great ape, uh, chimpanzees. So there's two types of chimpanzees. Pan troglodytes, which is regular chimp, or a chimp you probably think about when you think about a chimp. These are the chimps that are in movies. And then there's bonobos, or pan paniscus. These are chimps that actually act actually a lot more like humans. So they actually often have sex face to face, which is what we've often been told animals don't do. Um, they actually walk around on two legs quite often. And this is almost like too much like us, right? That's not enough like an animal for maybe us to be totally comfortable with. So you actually don't see bonobos in movies because in many ways they're disturbingly like us. And bonobos and chimps are our closest relatives. Similarities between apes and humans are more than just external morphology. There are internal similarities as well. So if we look at the skeletons here of Homo, which is human, Pan, which is chimpanzee, Gorilla, which is gorilla, and orangutan, which is orangutan, you can see that the skeletons are very, very similar. There are some differences in the pelvis and the shape of the skull, but they're remarkably similar, right? These are not totally different types of organisms at all. They're really very, very similar at the skeletal level. And when we look at the chromosomal level, there are genetic similarities as well. This is chromosomes 1 through 12 lined up, stained with gymsa, so you get chromosome banding patterns that are dark and light, depending on how much staining occurs. And if you looked at these four different chromosome number fours, and could you look at these four and instantly figure out which one is the human that's so very different from all the other three? And the answer is no, they're all really similar. They're almost exactly the same. And for each of these figures, it's lined up homo, pan, gorilla, orangutan. The biggest difference is actually in chromosome number two, where it looks like humans, our chromosome number two is the result of a fusion of what's called chromosomes 2A and 2B in our ancestors, which are still separate chromosomes in chimps, gorillas, and orangutans. But in the lineage leading to humans, after our split from chimps, we had actually a fusion. So you can see the top half of our chromosome here is like chromosome 2B in those guys bottom half is like chromosome 2A in those guys. But when you look at the great apes, right, the skeletons are very similar. And in fact, um, without even looking at the nucleotide sequences, just visually, you can see that the genomes are incredibly similar.